Peace is nice, isn't it? Well, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for all these wonderful people that are here. And we bless the ones, Lord, who couldn't. And we bless our worship team this morning, Lord. And just to soak in your presence. And we bless, Lord, the word that Pastor David has for us this morning. And that we would have ears to hear. And we would soak it in. Amen. There's healing in his presence. As I see this morning, there's some seeking healing. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. God here this morning he is absolutely he is. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. <laughs> well, welcome all. Welcome the new people. Welcome Robert. Got to meet someone this morning that knew my family. I'm like, we got to talk. Because <laughs> uh, you probably got some stories. Hey, Robert. Uh, that's good. That's good. So thank you for coming this morning. Yeah. And our newlyweds are here this morning. Mark and Cass, who just got married a few weeks ago. That's exciting. It was a beautiful wedding. Dana knocked it out of the park. She did. It was so good. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take up tithes and offerings this morning. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the tithes this morning. We thank you for the faithfulness, for the trust in those who give this morning. Lord, we know that you are our provider, our giver. And, Lord, that we can... Uh, lay this down before you, and may you bless it. May you bless it for your kingdom. May you use it. May we be wise with it as a church. So, Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So good. All right, we're in uh, Song of Solomon. Um, yeah, um, last week it didn't quite get through chapter 6. Who noticed that? Somebody noticed it. I guarantee someone was like, what is going on? We didn't finish chapter six. You're right, we didn't. So we'll get on to that today. I really love it too. Like Leo, you're talking about uh, John Bevere's message of uh, eternity. And um, man, John Bevere has some really good stuff. Uh, some good books. Some good, uh, uh, he wrote a, um, I don't know what you call it. Like It's like a story, a parable, an allegory called Aphabel. Powerful, powerful story. I would encourage you. It's great for kids. But as an adult, listening to it with my kids a long time ago, just convicted about my attitudes towards God and, uh, and how I view him and how I view what, what, I'm, what I'm dealing with here. Right? So many times the reason why we get so upset and so uh, in trouble here on this earth is because we don't have an eternal perspective. We don't understand that this is only temporary. In light of eternity... How will, how, what's our average age is, you know, around 80 years, right? 80 years divided by eternity is what? Zero. This is such a small portion of your existence, but it has a huge impact on that existence. Massive. And that's, I, I want to say this, Song of Solomon is this perspective that God loves you. You are loved by God. You can't change it. You can't do anything about it through the whole psalm. He's like, she is so beautiful. He's speaking that over you. You're so wonderful. He's so pleased. In your immaturity, in your you know, uh, fallen, broken nature, he says you're beautiful. And that, and that is an eternal perspective. God understands that this is temporary. He's prophetically speaking over your life from eternity. Do you know that eternity doesn't have time? 
Oh, this is a blow my mind topic. Okay, so God sits, looks into time from eternity. Just let that one soak in. There is no time. So he sees the beginning from the end. And he looks in from that perspective. He understands that eternity is waiting for your soul on the other side of this fallen, broken, sinful, your own nature in this world. And he goes, for eternity, your little time of weakness and brokenness here, divided by eternity equals zero. Do you see that? Your redemptive purpose that Jesus died for in eternity equals what? Everything. You will spend most of your existence known, loved by God in perfection, in, in, in maturity. That's who you are this morning. Oh man, we have got to get a hold of this. If we do not get a hold of this, oh man, the world, the devil wants to steal this from you. It wants to say the way I feel right now is the way it feels. Guys, I get it. I'm frustrated at moments where I'm like the emotions that I feel inside. I'm so like upset or I'm so just angry or frustrated at situations. It feels real, but it's not. This is the part that's not real. My emotions. I want to say this. When Dana and I got married, we're talking about marriage a little bit this morning. Dana got married. Before we got married, I had had relationships. I was engaged. Now we're going to go down a rabbit trail here a little bit. I was engaged to someone before I met Dana. Sorry, I had actually met Dana and I was engaged to someone else. And that's a crazy story. Come and talk to Dana about it afterwards. <laughs> Voluntold. But I want to say this. The biggest thing that shifted my paradigm, I had allowed my emotions and my feelings, as a young man, probably my hormones, to lead. To lead my life. And what did it bring me? Failed relationship. Broken relationship. Mistakes, immaturity. I remember coming to this place with the Lord and saying, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this love thing, I don't know what I'm doing. God, everything I've touched has fallen and broken into shambles. God, help me. Teach me. I want to know your ways. I want to learn from you. And you know what he said? He said, use your soul and your mind first. Then allow the other things, the emotions and the feelings to follow. Because I want to say this, in a married, married relationship, I don't care whether it's the body of Christ, whether it's friendship, or your marriage relationship, or our divine heavenly relationship with Jesus, there's so many times your feelings and emotions tell you something that is not true. I want to say it's 99%, well, maybe that's too high. A large majority of the time, your emotions are lying to you. Good or bad. Right? How do we know this? Right? You have some sort of substance. Man, that feels really good. They're lying to you. They're lying to you. Why? Well, I, 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 you know, we use uh, entertainment. Oh, I just want to veg out and just shut off my brain. It just feels good. Yeah, call it whatever you want. It's a lie. I'm not saying there's some good things that we are meant to enjoy. But there's some things that we only enjoy because it tells our emotions that we feel good. And it's a lie. And then the bad emotions, I think, are obvious. None of this is in my notes. <laughs> this is an eternal perspective, though. It just ignites my heart. I love John Bevere's messages on eternity. I'm telling you, he's got two massive messages of his life. One is forgiveness. Right? The bait of Satan is, is, is allowing yourself to hold on forgiveness. And then the other one is the eternal perspective. Man, oh man, if you want to learn about those two things in, in depth, John Bevere is your guy. So good. So good. But that eternal perspective goes, I don't feel good right now, but I know that eternity is a long time. And so I'm okay with not feeling right now because eternity is more important. It's not fair right now, right? Who, who's been unduly treated? Everyone should put, liars, put up your hands. <clears throat> right? You've not been, it hasn't been, you know, what's much of my kids? Well, that's, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair. And my response as a dad is, you're right. Welcome to life. 
It's not fair. It's not fair. Eternal perspective is this. Who's the final scorekeeper? Jesus. Who has the final say over your life and situations? He does. Who? Now I go, doesn't have to be fair here. I don't need it to be fair here. I don't need everything to go perfectly. I don't need all my relationships to be roses and butterflies, and they never are. I don't need to be, what's our world? It's like, you need to like do some stuff for you. It's like, it's all about you. And I heard this teaching one time from someone, I don't remember who was, some secular person was like, if two people, like you have to save some for yourselves, but if two people give 50%, then that equals 100%. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> no, delete, wrong. Eh. Yeah. No, two people giving 100%, giving everything they have. We're so consumed in our world. We're so, so temporal in our mindset that we bicker over, over, over gender differences and how it's not fair, or how we should respond with me, male and female relationships and leadership in the church and in marriage and all this stuff. Jesus goes, man, if we would just read what he wrote or what he said, he was like, say, husbands, treat your life like wife like I treated the church. He gave everything for her. He laid down his life. He didn't hold anything back. Husbands, you got issues with your wife? You know what the issue is? You're not laying your life down. It's coming, Monique. Careful, it's coming. But I agree, right? The other side of the coin is this. Wives, submit, right? Love your husbands, submit to them. Don't withhold yourself from them. Wives, you got problems in your marriage? Give yourself to your husband in every way. I'm not talking physically and sexually, just although that's super important. In every way. How many marriages? Oh, man. We might not get through my notes. <laughs> How many marriages the, there is no sexual union over long periods of time? That's a problem. That's a part of your oneness. If that's not happening, if that's not happening, you're not in a healthy relationship. Invest in each other. Give yourself. It's like, well, I would if. No. That's not Christ's example. Christ never said, I'll, I'll, I'll lay down my life for you if you receive my gift of salvation. Did you know that he laid down his life for those who will never accept him? Right. And he did it knowing that they wouldn't. Yeah. He's like, no, it's yours. My life is yours. No strings attached. I don't want anything out of this. I'm going to give myself wholeheartedly to you. Here's the, here's the cool part about scripture. We have like, oh, husbands lay down your lives. Wives submit to your husbands. Do you know that the way the, 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 the culture um, related examples like this is that it wasn't one or the other. It was both and. So if we were to read it properly, it's like husbands and wives lay your lives, lives down for each other like Christ did the church. Husbands and wives submit one to each other. Did you know that the helpmate, when, Adam, when Eve was created, did you know that God actually used the same word to describe himself in relationship to us? Yeah. <clears throat> so much of the body of Christ looks down on women and actually withholds their spiritual gifts and callings. And it's <laughs> such a travesty because God describes himself the same way he described Eve to Adam. A helpmate. It's too simplified. It is one that comes alongside and covers. It is one that comes alongside and fills in the gaps. Powerful. But what is it about? It's about an eternal perspective. How you love your wife, how you love your husband, how you love in relationship in the church and the body of Christ. That's an example to the world of how Christ loves them. Why is the world so disconnected with God, looks at Christians in a mocking, condescending tone? I was watching Star Trek, Next Generation. It's on Netflix. <laughs> Loved it as a kid. Six o'clock, right? Every evening, 6 p.m. Some of you, come on, someone was with me. <laughs> Monique, you don't even know. Do you? Oh. Okay, okay. I saw a hand back there, one here. I loved it. Sometimes it's like, 
You, you don't really want to watch the things that you, you loved when you were a kid because it just isn't the same. But I'm actually enjoying it. <laughs> it's actually relatively clean as far as entertainment goes. I just watched this episode where they're talking about the entire episode is about um, them observing a world, uh, uh, developing um, culture and trying to do it from a distance so that they're not interrupting the development of this developing world. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so they're trying to, and something goes wrong, and all of a sudden they're revealed. And now this, this culture now knows that they're there and knows that they're, and, if, and initially the, the culture thinks they're gods because they can like teleport out and in and heal, you know, whatever, and do all this magical stuff. And this whole episode is just preaching against the higher power, is preaching against God, talking down to it like it's some sort of lower level of intellectual. And it's like, oh, it just grieved me. I'm like, no, our world thinks they're so wise in rejecting God and rejecting an eternal perspective, but then they think nothing happens when they die. Yeah. Oh, that's when everything begins. That's when everything begins. It just pained my heart. I was like, the whole episode, I'm like, oh, that is, a, that is our world. But the problem is this. I can grieve over the world or I can show them something that represents God truly. That's what I need to do. Why does our world have that perspective generally? It's because we as the body of Christ have not displayed him in our relationships. By how you treat each other is how the world will know, Jesus says, that I am God. How do you live your life? Is it any different? Or is it just the same? Eternal perspective. Song of Songs. Chapter 6, verse 11. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. Or rather, well, we'll see. I'm going to try and move quickly. Um, it's like I started this in like May. <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is the book that just keeps on giving. Yeah. And we'll be in October before we're done. <laughs> yeah, we'll just go where we get. <clears throat> so, tiny review. What is Song of Solomon? It's a, we're, it was a book written about a husband and wife relationship. That's how it was actually written. Uh, it has lots of poetic language. It's not a historical document. It's a poetic document. But how we want to see it as a picture of us and Christ. We're the Shulamite bride. He is the king. And we want to put ourselves, insert ourselves into the story. We want to, we want to come into this place where we can, in, in chapter 1, be in this wonderful relationship with him where it's, it's like super exciting and it's really easy. And he's there and he's close. There's like, I mean the picture in my own mind is like, you're in a garden and there's like fruit, there's food, he's there, you're enjoying each other, it's warm, it's lovely. And then he draws away. As he draws away, he says, come, let's go. And she goes, nah, I like it here, I really like it here. He says, okay, no problem. Isn't that our Heavenly Father? He's like, okay, whatever you want, but I'm going. And then she goes, okay, you go. What does she say in, in the first part of the book? I'll come another day. There'll be another time where I'll come. Well, she does, she does eventually come. And then finally she's provoked to go, and she goes to come out of the garden, and she understands it's dripping with what? Myrrh, a burial spice. She needs to die to herself. There's some selfishness. There's some immaturity in her life that God is trying to work out. So he goes. She sees him. She sees him in this totally different context. She sees him dressed as a warrior, prancing on mountains. He's this like conquering warrior. And she's like, I don't know who that, like, that's you? You're the like really soft, feely, touchy guy in the garden who's like, it's all good. And, you know, all casual, sitting there relaxed. He goes, no, I'm a fierce warrior too. Come, come with me to this place. It's dangerous. 100% it's dangerous. Is it going to be difficult? Yes, very difficult. She's, she comes to this place where she realizes, I can't do it. I can't stay in all the things I like. Isn't that a picture of us coming out of the world? I've got, every, I've got everything I want, everything I like. I had someone tell me uh, a while ago, I like my life, Dave. I don't need God. Okay. <laughs> all right. Six months later, <laughs> he was in their heart because they realized something was provoking them. 
right? And they go, okay, I have to die to myself. One of the things that the gospel has been wounded, the gospel message has been wounded by this message of the garden and nothing more. It's all good. Jesus wants to make your life good. He'll make everything. It'll be happy. You'll have joy. You know, we, we paint this lovely little picture of life being great, but then we don't preach about the difficulty. We don't preach about the suffering servant. We don't preach about Jesus saying, actually what I did by laying my life down, by sweating drops of blood, by being beaten and, and torn apart my body so much so that it was barely recognizably a figure of a man. He says, you do that now. Ooh. Well, who would come to Jesus? Only those who understand that they need him. Mm. So he draws away. She finally comes. She's searching for him. As she's searching, she gets beat up. She gets wounded. She gets bumps and bruises along the way. Even people who are supposed to be leading her to him. <clears throat> those who should know how to connect with the Father, they're the ones who are doing damage. Speaks of church leadership. Speaks of the church itself. That people get so wounded by the church, and then they do what? They blame God. <clears throat> I heard this expression by Frank Turek. He's a great apologist. He says, if someone plays Beethoven, Beethoven, wow, that was a little lithexic moment there. <clears throat> Beethoven, if someone plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? Do you blame Beethoven? No, you blame the person who's playing him poorly. It's like, oh, you church people are all hypocrites. Yeah? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, this isn't a place for perfection. This is a place for broken people to come to Jesus. <clears throat> That's what the church is. If you've been wounded by the church, I mean, welcome to the club. We've all been there. The devil wants, you, wants nothing more than to separate you from the very thing that's going to lead you to Christ. He wants you to be alienated and wounded. He wants you to be bitter and cynical against the body of Christ. Here's the deal. Do you know someone who's married and you hate their spouse? Can you be in relationship with that person? Wayne, if you hated Dana, <laughs> and I'd be like, dude, I don't want to hang out with you. Right? It's like, she's, she did this to me and... <laughs> what? Too stubborn. Too stubborn. <laughs> you know what I mean, though. <clears throat> if you have a close friend, something happens in the relationship and, and now one of the... Right? Like, you do, it doesn't happen. Do you think for a second... I've got to be very careful when I say this. Do you think for one second... That Jesus wants to be in a relationship someone, with someone who hates his bride. Or won't be in relationship with them. Or what, can't stand being in the same room as them. This is tough stuff. But we need to check our hearts. We really do. And I want to say this. If you have wounded from, wounding from, and I've said this in the past. <laughs> some of it may be from me. Probably. Well, I guarantee it's out there. It's true. But you know what? As a pastor, I have to deal with wounding too. What do I do? Right? What, what's, what's, what do I hear from pastors? Well, careful, the sheep bite. Do you want to have to do with that? Woo, doggy. Let's just kick that out of my brain. Not that it doesn't happen. Not that stuff isn't difficult, because it is. But I go, God, I want to do what you've called me to, and I will love your bride. And you know what? You're going to use the wounding that the devil meant for me to separate myself. It's like I should just quit pastoring and go and work in construction again. I should go and do something else. It would be simpler. It would be easier. That's what the enemy says to me. He says that to each one of you. I guarantee in this room people are like, ah, I should just go to a different church. It would be better there. But you know what he wants to do? Just like the Shulamite bride, he wants to take the wounding that the devil wanted to cause separation and he wants to actually turn it around for your own good. You know why? Because we have an eternal perspective. We have our eyes fixed on Jesus. And we say, you know what? Yeah, but he's so beautiful. How? It doesn't matter what happens here. Now, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> oh, man. believe me, I'm not one to say you just sit there and get kicked. That is not what I'm saying. I am not, I'm not, uh, what would you say, uh, promoting uh, authoritative abuse. 
or, or, or abuse in relationships. No way. I won't put up with that at all. In fact, the best thing you can do to someone who's pushing you around is punch them in the nose. <laughs> oh, I said it out loud. For the young ones in the room, talk to your parents about that first. Metaphorically, metaphorically, I'm not joking though, like the best thing you can do to someone is just say, hey, enough. In fact, I'm not allowing you to do that anymore. No, thank you. No more. It doesn't mean you have to perpetuate whatever it is. I'm not saying do unto others as they, you know, no, no, no. That's for you. You need to do it. But how do we do this in the kingdom? You, how do you keep coals of fire on someone's head? You bless them. You pray for them. Right? The best thing you can do in those situations, you know, you slap the enemy in the face with kindness. You give him a bloody nose love. <laughs> Seriously. You say, how can I love you? you don't, maybe don't say it to the person. You ask Holy Spirit for whispers. Anyways, I spent too long in there. I think that might be a little... Oh, well, someone could take that out of context. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> so, she's at this place. She's gone to the difficult. She's come back wounded. Still hasn't found him. You see there's a large chunk of this book where they're not together. Where he's actually withdrawn his presence. And that's extremely common in the body of Christ. Where God removes his manifest presence where you can't feel him. You don't really know him. It feels like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and falling back. The word, when you read it, doesn't jump off the page like it used to. The worship is kind of dull and boring. It's like, I don't know, you just can't connect with you, Lord. Where are you? You know what that season's called? Maturing. 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 Growing up and going, God, I have to trust you. Even though I can't see you, I can't hear you, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to trust you. Go, that's the beauty of the word. You know that for most of, I'm going to say church history because I'm going to include pre-Christ, there was really nothing to go on. Well, David in Psalms, what did he have to go on? He says, oh, your law, O oh Lord. <laughs> go read the numbers. Go read Leviticus. David saw the heart of the Father in all of that. He said, God, I'm going, to, I'm going to trust your word. I'm going to trust who you are. And that's what she does. So we're coming to this place. She tests her. <clears throat> um, yeah, Matthew 16, verse 8. The primary call of each, minist uh, 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 of each ministry is to know God and to make him known. Working together with others to build the church and engage, engage in the great commission to make disciples. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Oh, what a powerful scripture. Who's building the church? Jesus. For leadership in the church? For pastors like myself? I'm not building the church. I can't build the church. It's not my job to build the church. What's my job? Matthew 28, 19, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Our job is this, go and make disciples. What does that mean? It means start engaging with people in your life. We talk about that a lot, about living your life on display and engaging in, hey, how's your day? Actually have a conversation. The beautiful part is those who are not interested are not interested. But I'll say this, the person that I told you that said, I like my life and it's okay, that person will stand here at this pulpit one day and share how Christ has impacted their life. Just because a rejection in eternity is not a rejection all the time. Sometimes it feels like, well, this is all doing nothing. Right? It's like going to the gym for one week and going, I'm sore and I'm just as fat and just as heavy. <laughs> right? It's like, no, do this for months and years. <laughs> do this over a long period of time. So, <laughs> oh. 6 verse 11. I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at a new growth in the valley to see the vines, uh, see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates were in bloom. So the bride commits herself to minister to those who are less spiritually mature. In other words, she set her heart to serve the church and make disciples to, of younger believers. Are any of us in this room doing that? 
Who are you discipling, is my question. Who are you leading? Who are you leading in your relationship with Jesus? Who are you communicating what you are learning? The other implication here that isn't said but is, is, is subversive in the language is that then there should be someone you're learning from as well. There should be someone who's older in the Lord, who's more mature in Christ, that you're saying, hey, I need to learn from you. And then there should be someone else who's like a younger, and doesn't have to be a younger person necessarily, but younger in the Lord that you can say, hey, can I teach you? I think if everybody, sometimes we want to wait for the invitation. But sometimes it might be an awkward conversation where someone goes, no, I'm good. But are you pursuing that, saying, hey, I could teach you something about the body of Christ. Would you like to do life together? It takes humility, yeah. It takes humility to go, I might not know as much as you. Or, yeah. But she's committed herself. She's looking. So the budded, she's looking for these little growths. The bride set her heart to serve immature, the immature ones, whose who's fruit, whose fr, who's fruitless, whose fruits uh, was just being was just beginning to bud and come forth. She sees God's vineyard without much, uh, without, without much mature fruit. So she's looking around, going, "Okay, we need some maturity." God's working on my life. How can I go and do relationship with someone else so that we can all grow together? She valued the budding virtues in others just as the Lord once valued the budding virtues in her. You need to communicate what God has spoken to you to other people. Every single one of us in the room, in this room, God has spoken over your life, has had impact in your life. And are you communicating that with others? Why do we do Testimony Sundays? This is exactly why. So that we can share with other people what's going on in our life. I'm excited for next Sunday. We've got some awesome testimonies. We've got some really neat stuff that God is stirring in people's hearts. And we're going to hear about it. It's so good. If you've never shared on a testimony Sunday. I like want to say a show of hands. But I'm not going to do that. Come and talk to me. Even if you're like. I don't want to do it. We need to get past that stuff (laughs) because your story is important for other people to hear. Really important. If you've never shared, come and talk to me. It doesn't have to be long or elaborate. You would even, I would say this, you write it out and I'll read it. You don't even have to stand up here. I would go that far. Right? Now there's no excuses, is there? Well, I don't know how to type. I'll type it for you or find someone who can. You won't be able to read my writing. No big deal. We'll record it, audio. (laughs) Everybody's like, oh, there really is no more excuses. (laughs) I am passionate about this. Because your declaration of what God has done in your life, I can sit here and preach every Sunday and fill the pulpit every Sunday. And it's okay. I'm doing what God's called. I'm trying to train and equip you guys to go out and do the work of the ministry. But I want to say this. Other, you here... Other people hearing your story sometimes has way more impact. Way more impact. And that's why if you do come, I'll encourage you to share it yourself. Because they need you. They need you uh, because you have the feeling and the intensity. I I just love Andrea. Like, (laughs) I don't want to go up to the front. (laughs) But why do you do it? Because God's calling her to do it. And you know what happens? Times like this morning. Where she pauses in the presence of Jesus and goes, it's so good to be in your presence, Lord. Right? When you tell your story and there's emotion behind it because you went through it, it's impactful. And the devil can't steal it. He can't say anything. He can't say, no, you didn't feel that. You tell him feelings are garbage. Get out of here. Went down. So the bride went down to God's garden to nurture the plants. That were merely budding. The bride says yes to making disciples. 
She says, yes, that's maturity. The growing up says, okay, I'm going to try and do this thing with someone else. I'm going to leave the comfort of the, of the familiar relationships, and I'm going to use that twofold, the familial relationships. Sometimes like, well, it's just you know, my wife and my kids. I'm, I'm discipling them. Yeah, okay, but that's a cop-out answer. Outside of your familial relationships. Step out and get into relationship. Relationships that are deep. There's no fruit, right? You see that? There's no fruit. These are, these are immature situations. And what's the desire? To cause them to mature. Do you know how you mature? Deep relationship with other people. Oftentimes other people <laughs> that you don't really like. Here's a true miracle. You want to see more miracles in the body of Christ? Everyone's cautious to answer that. You can actually be in deep relationship with someone you thought you could never like. It's true. It can happen. She says, yes. She says, I will go down to serve the body, to serve my community. <clears throat> the garden and, and vine. The vine, uh, the v- a vine, vineyard, or garden speaks of God's people. That's the body of Christ. Virtue, uh, <clears throat> virtue speaks of the, of the fresh greenness, of the flourishing vegetation. The bride went down to see the growth in God's garden in the midst of the valley of, its, of this fallen world. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. That's you and that's me. The bride's heart to serve the, the younger, the, the young speaks of more than serving to find a place of recognition, to feel better about ourselves. This is a call to give ourselves to others because we see them as the Lord's inheritance, not as an opportunity for us to open doors for promotion or to promote our ministries. It's not about getting another level of status. It's not about that. If it is, it will fall. It will fall. If it's built on our own things, it will fall. How many big guys with big ministries over the last five years have fallen? It's like one after the other after the other. And you almost start looking at the other ones that are still in place. And you go, okay, what's wrong with them? You go, what's happening? Well, it's not about big ministries. It's not about one person's big ideas. Here's the beautiful part about it. The teachings of those guys are not wrong. So many of us go, well, now I can't listen to anything. I can't read a book ever from, you know, the apologetics of uh, Ravi Zacharias. As one big one recently. It's like, man, he was phenomenal at sharing the gospel with people. Was he a broken, fallen human? 100%. But we need to do it with a selfless, humble, mature heart that goes, it's not about my recognition. It's not even about, you know, my, you know, some sort of ministry status. And that's stuff as a pastor, guys, that I have to work with constantly. All, all the time. <clears throat> it's like affirmation. You know, the, 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 the line is this. If you're, <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you're discouraged and depressed when things aren't going well, You're going to be proud and arrogant when they do. It's pride on both sides of the spectrum. Right? If if you all leave the church and no one shows up for services and we close the building down and I'm depressed and I feel a personal hit against me, then I clearly have pride in my heart. Because if it did grow and we did expand and stuff happened, then I would feel like it was mine. <clears throat> and the two things as a leader and as a pastor I fight all the time is people are constantly complimenting you and criticizing you. There's, a, there's not a lot of in between. <laughs> I say this, I've never been more hated than when I became a pastor. Now either people just didn't say it, maybe that was probably the situation. <clears throat> but I've never been more loved either. So what do I have to do? In the midst of things going well, I have to go, Lord, it's yours. It's yours, it's not mine. I did not build your church. You built your church, Lord. 
This is your church. Constantly, I pray over this congregation, our leadership prays over this congregation. This church is yours. It's not mine. It's not a board's. Aspen Ridge Christian Fellowship is in the hands of Jesus and Him alone. That's it. No more. I say this too. <laughs> if, if I move along, God will send someone better. That's the beauty of it. Now, don't kick me out too quick. <clears throat> but I'm convinced of it. If I leave, if I really feel like moving on is the right... No, don't let anyone get insecure. It's not, I just came off a sabbatical. It's not happening. <clears throat> but I trust Him with my life. And I trust him with this church. You know, Leo's like, you know, uh, uh, what were we talking about? It's like, Lord, I want to, you know, don't send me to uh, Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I love it here. My prayer is God keep me here. That's my prayer. I hope that's, it. You, you know, his heart for you too. In this church, in this community. That you're like, God, keep me here. I love this place. I love these people. Verse 12, before I realized it, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. So the bride, she's overcome with love for the king's people. Do you love the body of Christ? Are you excited about other believers, even in our town? Oh, let's get excited about the body of Christ and what he might do. We did a year of prayer and fasting. <clears throat> it ended last March. And I'm convinced through that whole time of praying for the lost of Athabasca, I know full well it won't all be manifest in this church. It's going to be manifest in our community. That's our heart. That's why we prayed. That's why our hearts are set for the body of Christ to be, to be glorified, not Aspen Ridge Christian Fellowship. If he glorifies us, Lord, help us to stay humble. I've said this in all the, in amongst all of the, the big name preachers kind of falling over the last, like one after the other, I'm like, Lord, keep me small. Keep me small. Keep me humble. Keep me... Keep the, the smallness the place I want to want to be and desire to be. <clears throat> but the chariots of the people speak of the church. While, while in the valley working with the budding vi uh, vineyards, her soul became like the chariots of, of, uh, of, no of her noble people, <clears throat> depicting the zeal that she left, uh, others in, left for others in the church. So she's so excited working with these immature believers that she's like, this is amazing. This is awesome. It's like, it's, this is like riding on chariots. I'm soaring across the mountains right now. And she's sitting with these broke, immature, sinful, selfish little guys in the body of Christ that are not very, you know, they're frustrating. They're not doing the things. And she goes, no, Jesus, I have an eternal perspective. I understand that this is a work. And the work that you did in me is the same work you're going to do in them. The same way that I had to learn through the process of life. I had to go through your processes, Jesus. They have to as well. And she gets excited. Why? This chariot <clears throat> gives her this eternal perspective. Her soul was moved like a swift chariot. The ancient word for chariot is... Uh, was, uh, the, in the ancient world, a chariot was the fastest way to travel. Right? <clears throat> there was no other way to go faster if you wanted to go somewhere. If you had any sort of luggage or, or cargo, it was a chariot. You needed a horse-drawn buggy. The best chariots belonged to the noble ones, so royal families, those of, of royal lineage. Her soul was made like a king's chariot that moved swiftly. She found strong desire to serve God's people. Instead of being put off by the immaturity, pride, lack of discernment of these budding uh, vines, she was surprised by their tender compassion and zeal because she recognized it in herself. She's like, yeah, they, they don't have to do it right. Don't be discouraged when someone says no or is prickly with you. I said this last week. It's like <clears throat> difficult situations are an opportunity. What are we supposed to do? Uh, um, was it Zechariah? Bless it, bless it. Needs to be our prophetic word over a difficult situation. We need to cover the mountain that is in front of you with blessing. And then it becomes a plain. What are you facing? What's the difficult things? Bless it. Honor the Lord. Too many times we're, we're, we're praying or speaking against negative things instead of engaging the positiveness of God's Spirit over a situation. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.7 Instead, we were like young children among you. <clears throat> just, as the nursing, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
right? Like a nursing mother. <clears throat> Here's the deal. A nursing mom has so much compassion for her immature, selfish little baby. What? All they do is eat, sleep, and poop, and cry. Right? And was like, oh, look at the poop. Look at the poop. They're eating so good. Isn't that what a mom thinks when their baby first poops? Like, look, they're eating so good. It's so awesome. <clears throat> That's the negative of the relationship. Right? So what in your relationships with one another, when, when negative things flare up, are we like a nursing mom with that situation? To go, huh? Huh? At least they're eating. Right? They're eating. They're producing because they're producing all this poop because they're eating. Okay, God, this isn't great. I've got to do some cleanup here. But at least something's happening. <clears throat> Before we realize it, uh, this phrase, uh, this new sudden movement uh, of her heart is, is for others surprised her. Have you been surprised by your heart for someone else where you're like, oh man, I never thought I'd have compassion for that individual or that situation or that circumstance? <clears throat> Talk about the, you know, uh, Otto and Melanie talking about the, the, uh, the care, what's it called? Care? Athabasca. Athabasca Cares. Yeah, Athabasca Cares. It's like, what does it look like to care for the homeless? What does it look like to care for those who are in need? You know, talk to the Daniels and the Yucatils about the food bank. It's no easy thing. Some of us sometimes can get, get bitter and wounded over, over abuses of the system. But God needs to tenderize our hearts so that we'll actually have compassion for those around us that we never thought we could. Jesus loves the whole church. His desire <coughs> is that every believer <coughs> be helped into maturity. He wants his people to value the whole church, not only the smaller ones under, the, under their authority. The Lord is bringing our church to unity and raising up shepherds who care about it. Here's the deal. <clears throat> the body of Christ is not just Ath Aspen Ridge Christian Fellowship. It's every church in Athabasca. The body of Christ isn't just Athabasca's churches. It's every church in our nation, in our country, around the world. We get so focused on our own little tribe, on our own little thing. Our town is actually a little microcosm of it because we've got, what, 12, 14 churches in our town? There's other towns in northern Alberta that are larger than ours and have like three churches, four churches. What does it speak of? We're not really united. There's a desire for the Lord, for sure, but there's not a lot of unity. And we need to promote that. We need to encourage others. We need to celebrate others' successes. Right? So often our feelings say this. When someone else, something good happens to someone else, we think, why not me? Well, I do. I'll just speak for myself. I won't ask for a show of hands. I think, well, man, shoot. I wish that could happen to me. In my selfish immaturity, I, I, I might even pout. Be like, oh, come on, God. Like, what the heck? Instead, my heart, my, a mature heart says this, sweet, good for them. Just because it's for someone, this is Dana's statement, just for someone else is not against me. It's not about God rejecting me just because someone else succeeds and thrives. It's about the kingdom and that's the eternal perspective going, God, it's not about us growing something here. It's about eternity growing. <clears throat> chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 12, 6 verse 12. Oh no, we already did that. <laughs> Review. Verse 13. <clears throat> come back. Come back, O Shulamite. Come back. Come back that we may gaze on you. Why would you gaze on the Shulamite as, one, as, as on the dance of Mahinium? So there's this weird contrast in here. So we look upon... Uh, the, the, the cry is, we want to look on you, Shulamite, come back to this place so we can see what God's doing in your life. And then the other part of it goes, um, um, why would you do that? Why would you gaze on the Shulamite? So there's two perspectives. The first uh, response is one of respect and admiration. Earlier, the daughters of Jerusalem wanted to seek the Lord with the bride. Uh, here, they urgently express this desire to learn from her by, cr by crying out to her four times to return to them. They want her to return to them 
uh, from her labors in the garden in the valley, uh, seen in Song uh, six, chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. They want her to come to them. There's this jealousy for her because she, they've seen her heart ignited and passioned for Jesus. What do you see in the Shulamite? <clears throat> so the second response was sarcastic, presumably the jealous watchman. So there's, there's, there's this contrast in the body of Christ who celebrate with her and want to draw and learn from her. There's the other part of the body of Christ who's sarcastic about her growth and actually go, what is that? It's no big deal. They're sarcastic and they're cynical about it. We talked about this earlier, about young ones in the body of Christ, when they come to know the Lord early on, they're very excited. They're very jovial. They're very, you know, uh, they lack some tact in the kingdom where they just kind of spread all their stuff everywhere. And they're like, oh my goodness, Jesus is so amazing. And then the older ones have a tendency, what? To look down a little bit and go, yeah, it'll pass. Yeah, there's not much to see there. Yeah, well, whatever. It'll temper. What is, the, what is the message? No, don't be like that. Celebrate with them. Embrace it. Embrace it. Allow it to, 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 to provoke your heart and ignite your heart to love Jesus even more. Allow it to bring you to the place where your heart was ignited with Him. Maybe you're in a dry season. This is the beauty of the body of Christ. I'm in a dry season. I haven't heard from the Lord. He seems distant. Nothing's going on. And all of a sudden, someone comes into my sphere of influence who's just on fire. And you almost want to be sarcastic with them. Right? You're wounded. Get over yourself. Get over it. Lay down your pride and your wounding and say, you know what? I need this right now. I need this. This is going to provoke me. This is going to motivate me to, to, to go, go further and go deeper in the Lord. The two camps can speak of a conflict between the daughters and the watchmen related to how they view the bride, obviously. So there's a translation that talks about the, two dan the, the dance of two armies. Uh, the dance of two companies says uh, in another translation. Uh, that's the, that's the Mahan, Mahanium. That's that phrase translated. So was a, this was a city associated uh, with the conflict between two brothers, Jacob and Esau. So there's this, this back and forth. So the difference speaks, uh, this speaks of uh, the interaction between two camps or companies in the church related to the bride's zeal for God. And this truly is. Revival happens somewhere in the body of Christ. And what happens? There's two camps. One camp gets on board with it and goes, this is awesome. The other camp sits back sarcastically with their arms folded and goes, yeah, whatever. We'll see. We'll see if it's truly, you know, the, the last great kind of revival that swept through the church was the uh, kind of refreshing in the, in the mid-90s. Part of the body of Christ embraced it. Most of it folded their arms and looked sarcastically down and went, that's not God. There's testimony over, of pastor over pastor and pastor going, finally going to the Vineyard Revival in, in Toronto and finally encountering Jesus for, the, you know, for what he was doing there and came back and their churches blew up. Let's embrace what God is doing. Sure, there needs to be discernment. Yes, we need to have, have uh, you know, um, a steady-mindedness to the whole thing, for sure. But we also want to embrace what God's doing. <clears throat> so these two camps, um, there are always two extreme positions in the body of Christ. Those who pursue Jesus with fervency and those who don't. Wholeheartedness is at the core of some of these divisions. It's like you're too extreme. We even say that you're too extreme. This, 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 this life that you're pursuing, it's too much, it's too intense. And maybe the, the, the beauty of it is this, is that just because one person is pursuing God a certain way doesn't mean everyone is called to do that. But it doesn't mean that you criticize how the other person is pursuing Jesus. You need to say, okay, it's their, it's their journey, it's their role. Am I doing, the question should always be, am I going to personalize this and go before my father myself and say, Lord, what are you calling, what are you asking me to do? What am I called to do? Am I, is this provoking something in me that maybe there's some immaturity and deadness? Maybe there's some pruning that needs to happen in my own life. Matthew 10, 34. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Man, oh man, what would Jesus do? He'd get his sword. You know, we have this, this uh, view in the body of Christ. We're going to end with this thought. We have a view in the... Oh, man. I got like... I was hoping to get through chapter 7. <laughs> Next week. 
We have a view in the body of Christ that Jesus is loving. He is only loving. He only does things that are loving. But then the problem is, is our definition of love. What does love look like? What does love look like? You know, Scripture says this, a loving father disciplines his children. How much more your heavenly father? Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. In fact, peace, peace, peace is a warning of the Antichrist spirit in Scripture. Everyone yelling peace. Everyone, peace and safety. Let's just make everything okay. Jesus is like, eh. Here's the deal. Impacted by the, by the presence of an eternal creator demands that you make a choice. You don't get to sit on the fence with him. There's no halfway, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little, I'll dabble a little with Jesus. Those that think they are, what does Jesus say about the lukewarm? He's like, I'd rather that you were either hot or cold. It would be better for you if you actually hated me and walked the other direction. Because here's the thing, we talk about eternal perspective, the eternal damnation for those who knew the truth of the gospel and rejected it, that's a special punishment for eternity. Whoo, doggy, that's a sobering thing. Scripture talks about that very clearly. That's why Jesus is like, it'd be better if you just hated me and didn't know me. But for you to know who I am and then reject me, it's a bad day for you. So what do we do? It demands a response. You, stick, you come in contact with electricity and see how you respond. Can anyone not respond when you stick your finger in a light socket? Demands a response, doesn't it? How much more the power of the creator of the universe? Oh, it demands a response. It says you have to respond. And it will be violent in your life. Why are Muslims going to be the best new Christians this planet has ever seen? Because they understand that. Because we can come to Jesus and dabble our toe a little bit in the waters of Christianity and this relationship with him with zero consequences. In fact, if we've got a heretical preacher, he'll say, it'll actually make your life better. Just do it. No. There is a demanded response. And it means bringing a sword. What does Jesus say? If your eye sins against you, what? Pluck it out. If your arm's sinning against you, what do you do? Cut it off. Oh. That's not very nice gospel message, Pastor David. He demands a response, not me. He demands a response from your heart. And we have to respond. And here's the beautiful part. As we read about the Shulamite, we'll go into chapter 7. I guess we're going a few more weeks. As we go into chapter 7, which I was excited to get to. <clears throat> we see her maturing and growing. We see her developing in her relationship with her Heavenly Father. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for your spirit this morning. God, for your direction and your presence in our worship. God, in the encouragement of an eternal perspective of a bridal relationship. Hmm. Lord, it's so good. It's so good. Jesus, we love you this morning. God, help us in our relationships with one another, Lord, to go to difficult areas, to go to deep areas that are, that are not safe, it's scary. Um, it's confusing. It's, there's tons of unknown in those places. Lord, give us boldness to go to the deep areas with you, God, because those are the places that are going to cause us to grow and, and mature and give off mature fruit. God, I pray that budding virtues are not where we end. In Jesus' name, mature fruit is our end. So, Father, we ask for that this morning. We ask for it. And Lord, as we walk deeper in, in this communion relationship with you, in this bridal relationship with you, Lord, help us. Lord, we need you. Father, our every waking moment, God, I pray that our, our spirit would be crying out for more of you. Jesus, we love you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.